Welcome everybody back to another recording of our Better Business, Better Life podcast with Jenny Clift. And today I'm really excited to introduce Renee Wingfield. And I'm just going to read off my my brief here. Renee is an artist, an entrepreneur, a mum and a semi-retired trapeze artist. So Renee, I'll get you to do a quick intro before we get into our best professional and best personal, but tell me about, we just had a quick chat. You started, you grew up on a farm. How on earth did you end up as a trapeze artist? Um, that's, uh, that's a question that I sometimes find myself answering. Um, I grew up in the most pristine, beautiful place called Bremer Bay in Western Australia, part of the Fitzgerald National Biosphere. Technically it's not remote, but it is, pretty much the southern tip close to Sir Esperance. So it's pretty quiet. I had like three kids in my year at school. We had 30 kids in our pre-primary, uh, primary school wow. totally. So the small farming community that was that's fishing, was fishing and, and farming. Um, and I think one of the things that's such a benefit of being a farm kid is wide open spaces and nothing but free time. You know, growing up in the 80s, just no, there was, I mean, we had AABC, that was, uh, that was pretty much it. Um, <laughs> And so you make your own fun. And I actually had a terrifying fear of heights. And so I'd push myself to climb things. I nearly fell out of the Gloucester tree as a kid. And so I would constantly try things to, to, um, to climb. Um, and then, you know, one thing led to the other and I wound up going to school in a place in Albany and I wound up in gymnastics because I was physical and bored, not very good at gymnastics. And my mum put me in a theatre and circus recreational program because there was four choices and I definitely am not a dancer. Um, <laughs> and that was at, you know, nine. And so at the time there was lots of community funding. So I got the opportunity to do lots of shows. I timed out in that sort of practice at about 14 when I discovered soccer, became a um, referee, only for my referee in WA for quite a long time. Left that when I fractured my spine at uni, um, which was a fun time. Don't run mm. on hard ground sideways for, you know, 30 hours a week in male games where you've got to run 10 plus Ks in that time. Wow. Uh, and so when I had to have all my reconditioning done, uh, my then physio said, you've got to do something. You've lost all your core muscles. Um, how about yoga? And of course, being the uneducated farm kid who'd never been anywhere at that stage, uh, I said, yoga's for hippies. What else you got? Um, <laughs> and he's like, well, that's not up to me. And I said, oh, I did trapeze as a kid. Maybe I could try that. And he's like, that's a great idea. Just don't fall off. <laughs> um, so I found the one circus school at the time and uh, still at uni. And then 12 months later, I found, my, found myself graduated from uni running that circus school, which was then... Um, Sec Berserk and is now uh, the Western Australian Circus School, Circus WA now, sorry, it's gone through a couple of naming conventions, which set me on the path to start flip tees and travel the world and train in China and acquire many, 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 many more injuries and many more experiences. Yes. What an amazing journey and all from the age of, you know, of nine and, and uh, trying to cure your own fear of heights. Amazing. So I'll get you to share a, um, a professional and a personal win, and then I'll get you to share a bit more about your business and what you do. Um, well, there's a couple going on at the moment. Um, number one, we've just submitted a major business plan for our second business, which I would love to share at another time, which is completely left field of where we are now but is in line with my personal mission of a big bold beautiful life um in a journey to make the world more fun and safe uh from an artist's point of view one of my favorite things that i've done in the last couple of years um we did it's gonna sound so silly so i've worked as a mermaid professionally um for like 14 years it's one of my many nom de plumes uh part of fringe world here so dubious title of queen of the mermaids and i always wanted to have a mass migration so we did a mass migration of mermaids here in western australia at Coogee, um pristine we had 78 mermaids rock up or com all different communities like representation from anywhere we possibly could um and so we have the australian record for most mermaids on a beach so that was a huge win not a it's not a shiny like profiteering in fact we lost money but 
there was something really magical about all these incredible different bodies, all different spaces culminating to flop around on the beach in 32 <laughs> degrees on this like pristine beach. And I just felt this, you know, this together moment of like, it took 14 years to get this, to have trust from the community, to have appetite from clients um, and to get the joy. And a thousand people rocked up to see it. It was, and we made like four different wow. new services. It was, it was insane. So we're, we're just about to release that for the next one for next year. And we really want to beat the world record, which is I think 300 or 327 held in China. Um, just so one day. But it's just those silly little, you know, gamified fun things that you can physically see and people get excited for. And you make my life feel so boring. <laughs> How on earth did you come up with that idea of a mass gathering of mermaids? Uh, look, the mermaid community is, is pretty unique. I, I, I wound, I, I literally fell into it not by training or anything like that i mean i guess as a western australian kid you spend most of the time in the water you know, as a young child in the ocean um but i saw this image of i think it's the original peter pan of mermaid cove it's an in, black and white image and there's like 10 mermaids on the beach it was shot somewhere in la it's all completely falsified and i just went that's really cool like what does that look like now like what does a real life moment of that nostalgia and hope look like now in a modern world and I just sort of kicked it around and originally I was like oh maybe we can do ocean cleanup which is something I'd really like to have in that um, give back component of these kind of community events um but then I just got down to the really basics and the, and the basics are just about a moment of suspension of disbelief and being lost because they're few and far between like film film does it out does this so well but you know, like, why does Santa still exist? Why does the two theory that we need those moments to be connected? And culture is about sharing moments. And that's what we've built so many of our um, experiences around. And it's so true. I, I'll share one day with you the story of how I accidentally told my older son that the Easter Bunny wasn't real, not realising that at the age of 11, he still believed. Um, <laughs> And so that, that, that was a, you know, mother of the year moment. But, you know, when I look at Christmas, my kids are now adults. Um, and, you know, I look back on those early days of them and believing in Santa and, you know, believing in the Easter Bunny and all of those things and the Tooth Fairy. And, and it is, it's just that, that magical wonder that when you don't, and your little one's three, um, you know, we don't have that now. Christmas, our, you know, kids are spread around the world and, um, you know, often it's just Nick and I and it's, it just doesn't have that same magical feel of wonder. So you live in a, in a pretty amazing uh, space in that sort of art and, and artistic and, and uh, performing world. But tell me about Flip Tees. What is it that you actually do? Because you have you'd said earlier you have 80 people on your books. Yeah, so we have um, approximately 80 artists and makers. Western Australia is a small market, so everyone's a freelancer. But, and our business is significantly seasonal. So we have a very broad range of circus performers, variety performers, just uniquely talented people in, in very special niches that don't fit anywhere. I always kind of joked we're like a stable of misfits that can be propped <laughs> up really well. Um, and what a great uh, place to be. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Never do anything expected. It's, uh, it's, it's fun, but do it well. Um, so just kind of figuring that out and, you know, that was certainly my story as an artist is like I was always too tall or, you know, too tall, too short, wrong coloured hair, whatever. I was like, I'll just make my own vehicle and book myself. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, over that time, so at, at the beginning up until COVID, Book Tees was very much my vehicle to have the big, bold, beautiful life that I wanted and I, I got a lot of that. Um, in fact, I did everything that I sought after except perform off a hot air balloon, which is still on my list. Um, hence, semi-retired. You've got to keep these things open. <laughs> uh, but I did perform off a flying carousel horse uh, at a major event maybe 12 months ago. I've wanted to do that for a long time. And there were little girls at the window screaming, hitting the windows because they saw a flying horse uh, with a showgirl on the back. But, you know, why not? Yep. Yeah. 
Yeah, so Flip Tea is sort of, um, when the COVID hit Flip Tea, I realised that I, I really felt really strongly that live experience should be a significant part of any cultural experience. And even though there was this huge push to go online, I really felt even more pushed to make sure that moments of connection were really established and that we really wanted to focus on that. So our mission essentially is to spread joy through live experiences and shared moments. That's that's Flip Teaser's mission. Um, so how did how was your business affected through COVID? Because WA was locked down, like your borders were closed, but you didn't have the lockdowns that other places in Australia did. So did, were those performances <laughs> still going ahead? Or let's, I'm kind of a little confused that, about how. It, no, no, no. I'm, I'm actually interested because I know, um, you know, you really couldn't leave or if you did, you couldn't come back. Um, mm -hmm. We certainly couldn't get into WA. But, but my perception is that kind of life went on still as normal-ish. Oh, okay. But were live performances still happening? Let's have During a let's COVID? Have, let me let me give you the the really fast timeline as we experienced it and and for anyone listening, uh, we're, this state is privileged in the fact of location with you know the perfect place oh, for so, a zombie apocalypse. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're a wealthy mining state. You know we deliver a huge amount of money to the economic hub. We had a very strong leader over that time, mm. um, who was very definitive in his decisions, and we also had a lot of. Um, we're a very tight community, even though, you know, we're a big state. There's actually not a lot of people here. So people are pretty, yeah. pretty tight and supportive. Yeah. So and I think through that isolation, a very resilient population and you've kind of got to um, make things work for you because it's not easy. Like, you know, Sydney, Melbourne are an hour away, but Sydney or Melbourne to Perth is, is a long way. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And there were, there were some serious, um, I don't know if anyone recalls, but there was massive uh, shipping breakdowns over that time with fires mm. and floods. And there's only one line into Australia on, a, on one rail. Like there's some interesting things going. Anyway, mm -hmm. short timeline. And we don't want to get political, <laughs> but I'm just interested in, um, you know, the the live performance and how that how that changed, I guess, through, through so, COVID. Very simply, we went down in March and I watched um, one of my biggest... This well, March was, 2020? Yep. Yeah, yeah, so we yep. managed to get our Fringe Festival in. It was really, it was eerie. So we finished Fringe Festival, everything. People just stopped coming out because they saw it on the wall. But we saw a couple of performers and I sitting in the in the Pleasure Garden, still wet from being in the tank, performing to no one, <laughs> going, this is going to go sideways. We can all see it. I called a couple of clients trying to get their ideas. And then by mid-March, it was like everything was down. Um and you know we'd lost all our revenue and at that stage fortunately i had zero very little overhead it was just me my husband was able to work full time so we weren't really at risk um personally yep. as a family um apart from the ongoing fear of what the hell is going on <laughs> you weren't um, alone there <laughs> yeah like everyone else but also going we're yep. also in the in the safest place with a rich economy with amazing services here Yep. Second thing that happened uh, is I fell pregnant in the first four or three weeks um, and I couldn't go to a hospital uh, and I had such intense morning sickness and migraines. I, and I was so, we were so worried to go to the hospital because we were told that we couldn't conceive so we didn't know what it was that I was like, well, I'm either pregnant or I have a, or a brain tube or something's going on. Maybe it's just like, who knows, right? Anyway, it turns out pregnant. Uh, so that's good for good, me. Good timing, I must <laughs> good say. Good timing. <laughs> Uh, I would have been, it's hilarious because uh, I would have been doing like 60 shows in that first two months um, personally and there's just no way that would have happened. Um, so all that was going, I was just trying to claw, we had some really great uh, clawback procedures in some of our cancellation policies so I managed to get a bunch of cancellation fees without significant cost because a lot of them were local government and compassionate uh companies so i was able to pay out a significant amount of my artists to make sure that they were able to live so just in spite of the yeah. advice of my then advisor i'm like if i don't have artists we don't have a business so we just got to do what we can and we're okay mm -hmm. june came along so i'm still calling my clients because local government especially everyone's shattered trying to make it work everyone's cancelling events no one knows what's going on and just trying to be supportive I came up with two really unique products. I had literally these giant bubbles, like inflatable bubbles, which are known as Zorbs. And I just said, hey, I know you're doing all these driveway gigs like everyone for mental health. 
why don't we stick performers in bubbles and walk them <laughs> And mask these spaces. That way there's no contact issues. No one has to wear a mask. People can see their faces. So we did it. And that was, you know, a significant amount of sales. And we could keep performing even when there were lockdowns because there were limitations. They weren't full lockdowns for a lot of the cases. They were more um, reduced capacity implementation than mask. So, and then, you know, we had some clients who were just like, how about we put you in the back of trucks? I'm like, yeah, can I roller skate off the back? So we got Main Road's permission to attach a bunch of us like Back to the Future with a full sound system on the back of a pickup truck and drive around local councils. And that was a significant contract. And there was only so many people that, because we had, I've got extensive um, risk management in being a trapeze artist and I'm also an advanced license rigger and work, have worked with some really great people. So there was not really anyone else they could, they could come to and we already had these relationships. So that's like August. We are closed down. Nothing is happening. And then I start getting these phone calls from some of my clients going, hey, we don't think we're going to be able to get our Eastern States providers here. Do you want to come in and have a meeting? And I was like, yeah, I do. <laughs> so suddenly, what a silly question. Uh, oh, no, no, you know, a uh, bit busy. <laughs> exactly. So I just saw the writing on the wall and went, I reckon I've got two years of no competition. And I was right. And so we managed to scale with almost four times the size we were at the beginning of COVID. And I had no wow. employees, no office. I uh, probably had six, seven artists. And then I joined EO at, in that August. Um, okay. and oh, so you, you were new to EO when I met you as a trainer. Yeah. Uh, yes, I was pregnant. That was my first session. That's right. Yeah. 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 And so it was just like we went from literally the business is going to die. And that was okay because it was just me. It was no risk to make a choice. You've got this massive opportunity in front of you. What do you need to do? And I started by hiring my project manager, who's now my 2IC and integrator, Natalie, who's phenomenal. Um, and then we also, because we're an unfunded arts company and I don't play in the funding sphere typically because i think it's really valuable for arts organizations that do need that assistance i need an attitude check on this but that's okay <laughs> um and so we were able to get some of the new apprenticeship uh, money which substituted roles for training and so that gave me a heap of scaling opportunity and reduced risk um to bring on full-time staff and then from there we just went bang <coughs> bless you Sorry, I'll have to get that bit edited out. 17.49. Okay. I did it yesterday too when I was doing another one every so often. I just get these coughing attacks. Okay, sorry. So you were... So we managed to um, procure training funding instead of project funding, which was okay. amazing. And, gave us, and that was through another EO member actually and my coach um, connected us. Uh, my peer, my peer coach, and so that was phenomenal. And I would have done another one had I could find more staff. Um, and then it was all about pipeline. And I realised that I had a, a couple of scalable products in our Christmas market. We do beautiful Busby Berkeley styling, giant roving presents, giant roller skating baubles. You know, we are joy bringers. Like that's that's our role. So we make these ridiculous Christmas spectacles that are about suspension of disbelief. And you know. I'm not sure when this is going to edit, but, you know, we've deployed Santa from rooftops. We've had him, he's going to be coming in on a rickshaw, another one. He's coming on a jet ski. Like, it's all about spectacle and right. that moment of magic. And that's I'd love to see called. into your store area. Oh, it's a mess. <laughs> I mean, it's not. We have, like, <laughs> um, so we also managed to, with a lot of support, we procured our first premises this year. The price of operational floor here is uh, triple what it was prior to COVID. So managed to negotiate um, with a, a building tenancy for a really great lease. Um, so we fill out 250 squares plus three desks. So I've got one, two, got two full time plus me plus uh, plus our wardrobe team member, and I, we're going to probably have two more by the end of this financial year. It was fill the space. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Just imagine the the wardrobe yeah. space. Yeah. So coming out of COVID, you said that you you know you knew you had two years without competition. What happened coming out of there? What was your what was your strategy, I guess? And then what sort of unfolded as as borders started to open up and people started to travel more? Uh, relationships, relationships, relationships is what I was focusing on because one, um, our job as an arts company is to solve our clients' problems. And, you know, we're WA, again, wealthy market, high brand um, space as well because, you know, I can't think we're like the most number of millionaires per head of population in Australia. Could be Southern Hemisphere now, I don't know. So there's this very much want for high end brand space. Um, And you have to achieve that, you need significant trust with clients and stakeholders. And we actually call them, we're all stakeholders because in in many ways we've grown partnerships between us. So mm-hmm. for the for our clients to succeed, you know, yes, there's 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 probably some other unique operators out there. Um, but the cost now to bring them over is so significant. Oh, it's like three or four times. And we're able to provide in person value. You know, those 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 relationships really matter. Like I know I've had some from my clients for 12, 14 years now. Like they've been with me on the whole journey. So it's, it's always about people, especially yeah. when you make magic. Yeah, people do business with people they like and they trust and all those sort of things. 100%. So when do people come to you? Do they have an idea and they are looking for somebody to bring it to life or are they saying we want an event tell us what you can do it's a bit of a mixture and so we don't provide events as such so we we entertainment for essentially end-to-end entertainment solutions in a very niche space we don't do musicians although we will collab with musicians we don't really provide dancers although we collab with dance companies Mm -hmm. into our spaces i think what we really are defining are is like we're a creative production house for highly in spectacles where we use our own intellectual property and calibre unless we're presented with a brief. And we have done some outstandingly fun conceptual briefs with some of our long-term clients. Um, include, you know, we, we did a massive activation in partnership with DGPR, Lottery West, West Coast Eagles. I'm probably missing someone here um, to produce the ninth Lottery Ball in 2018. And that was a... Um, we were just given a concept saying there's going to be this much and we need nine three metre helium balloons moved around an oval. Here's a budget. And so, you know, three weeks turnaround, you've got to work out how to deal with a class gas in a high uh, risk environment in front of 55,000 people with, you know, one of the biggest funders in Australia on a day when there's four events and you've got to hire 23 artists that you don't have at the time. And no pressure. Them, no pressure. Oh, you only get two <laughs> rehearsals and you're not allowed to run on the grass because it was Optus and the very, you know, like it's very sport orientated. So we oh, did it. Okay. It was well received. I'm pretty sure I went a little grey, but it was so much fun. So much fun. I'm like, I really, we joke about spectacle, um, like especially on-field activation. On-field activation is like passion. It doesn't come along very often. Budgets aren't generally what people think, but man, they're fun. And I always joke about, cool, so we're going to do another circle show, which is literally let's run something out in the middle, do a big circle, and then run back. (laughs) How do we do that in a count of eight? (laughs) So how much planning, how much time goes into planning something like that that lasts for what just a few minutes oh we've had things that have lasted like 15 seconds um it completely depends completely depends on the stakeholders crowd playing to a crowd of fifty-five thousand is completely different than doing a private event we had a private um uh event at crown the presidential suite you know obviously vip high caliber very wealthy client 60 guests how we play yeah. there and the planning that goes there there's a lot more personal attention to detail and client liaison in that environment as opposed to dealing with six stakeholders in a large mm. stadium. So not everything is perfectly scalable because a lot of our stuff is niche, but the process is quite the scoping, the delivery, the exiting. That's all the same process. It's just that there's less of it when there's 60 people. Yeah. It just means you've just got to be 100% true. Um, and then some of those bigger projects, like, I mean, we only had three weeks to turn around 
that one. But at the time I didn't have 60 shows in 40 days and I didn't have staff. It was just me and an assistant at the time and great stakeholders that I could ask questions for. And then I literally just on the phone, on the phone, on the phone, on the phone, and then cast, cast, cast. So completely varies. We, we have some bookings that are in play for 2026 at the moment. So, you know, people wow, can be okay. really organized, especially if they're major tourism or, um, you know, I, not that we're doing it, but I would like a world expo that happens way out in advance or, you know, so expo is actually really organized on average. That could be a year out. Um, you know, we've also done events with less than 48 hours notice, nice. but they tend to be small. Um, yeah, sometimes we get well, a Somebody client. decides today that they'd like a mermaid at their birthday party on a Friday night. Yeah. And tomorrow is a hard no because we are completely booked out. But <laughs> yes, 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 it is. Oh, um, damn. Yeah. So next well, my time. husband's got a big birthday coming up in uh, in December in Bali, so perhaps we can chat about doing something then. Sure, let's bring, let's bring a whole pod. Um, yeah. And we can put those giant uh, inflatable balls out there with some light-up characters, very Met Gala. Yeah. I'm sure he would love that. Oh, so honey. It's, it's been wild. Like I, one of the reasons I love being an artist and between the artist and entrepreneur, especially in the live performance space, one, people vastly under, underestimate the artist. Like they never, they never assume unless they've known me for a long time, A, I'm the owner and the creative. Um, they just, you know, your, your function and piece, everyone's pretty nice to us. We've never had, really had any issues. But the amount of conversations that, and networks that you wind up with is just phenomenal. And I'll never forget the piece of advice that I had from one of my early mentors, which is never trust an artist because they mix with all sorts of people. <laughs> oh, God, I can only imagine. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Fun. Leave, leave that one alone. <laughs> yeah, I've signed many NDAs, I cannot tell. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. One of the things that we lo love in from my EOS practice is process and about, you know, um, doing things the same way again. How do you manage that? Because there must be some um, sort of repeatability within your business, whether it's around, I guess, safety or, uh, but oh, yeah. what does that look like for you? Uh, well, I'd love to show you my Monday spreadsheet and because <laughs> that booking process from scope to end to, to um, review and invoicing and then fill a follow-up could be as long as 40 steps, um, like how we make toast, right, the early, yeah. the early example. Mm -hmm. So, again, some of those steps aren't always in it depending on the risk level, but the steps are exactly the same thing, you know, yeah. inquiry or, or lead physical phone call, scoping, ask the question, you know, who, what, when, when, why, what does this look like if it's successful? What does it look like when it's a failure? Like, you know, the sales process is essentially the same and the gathering of information is really critical. And then there's a re-scope, um, you know, some are more complicated than others. They might take three or four meetings. That's okay. Um, and then it's going through project management, casting, packing, production, resourcing, ordering, executing. Executing is often the simplest thing because everything's yep. done then. And then, you know, making sure everything comes back and is washed. Not fun. <laughs> I can tell you on a 40 degree day, that's not a fun day for mm. anyone. Um, I hadn't thought of then, that. You know, yeah. And then post follow up with um, stakeholders, performers, clients, returns, invoicing, follow up, checked for next year. Like it is, the process is the same. The bit that I really struggled with is um, until I took on, I wasn't very good at standardising uh, systems, like standardised, especially pay rates for artists, because I'm very passionate about making sure that artists get opportunities and are paid properly and are paid promptly because it's something that media pushes a lot, that, you know, the poor starving artist mentality, um, which I am not a part of. Uh, so I wanted to make sure that was in place. And once my 2IC and my, my talent manager joined me, we, had, we just have a really bulletproof process. So I don't touch that stuff. I just scope the event now. They budget it with the standards that we agreed on that get reviewed every six to 12 months. And suddenly it was easier. And then we yeah. built it. The, the system started to build itself because we work with autonomy in that space and we talk to each other. Um, and we have built that system since I had systems in place that were okay. Um, and then we continually built them over 
the last couple of years, we have built four systems and broken every single one because our growth from COVID has been like consecutively 17 to 25%. And really, whenever we rebuild the next thing, we're like, oh, 10%. That's, that's probably all we're going to see with an increase. No, no, that didn't happen. So we're really good at stress testing. <laughs> <laughs> which just, is a good uh, thing growth is good growth uh, yeah, sustainable growth continued growth yes. not growth yes. well, and but growth that um that breaks a system that forces you to do things better is also good yeah, yeah. we Gro our park list is you know we use the start stop stuck um and a lot of our stops is like this system doesn't work anymore what can we do you know are we getting to the point where we have to completely create a unique system my thing is like mm, not yet because we haven't hit this margin and I'm, you know, my trends are going, will this dreaded R word in Australia affect us and how that will affect us? I have theories, but I want to make sure that, you know, that we're stress testing even those projections because the opposite could be true. And that was certainly my experience when we started Flip Tees in 2006, we were in a, a recession then in Western Australia and we went banana. Like we, we were able to quit our jobs at the time and be full-time artists within two years, even in the middle of a recession, and everyone's going, why? I'm like, because people are drinking <laughs> and people want entertainment and they want to be, they want to be drawn away into a much more exciting world than not having a job or having a hopelessness. We're there as shiny objects that provide hope. So the, you've probably heard me say this, you know, routine will set you free. Interesting that, um, you know, and I know you're you're visionary as many business owners are. That, um, but you know, we just we just have to have those systems in place. And um, even better is when we have the systems and the routines, and somebody else does them. Uh, that's my favourite. Um, I still have to do it myself, but making you know, making sure there are other people who can do that. Um, I was on my last podcast. Um, we we're talking about the you know the current economic climate and what are you seeing and most of your work is locally in WA but um, the comment from Jason was that um, there's a bit of reluctance a bit of delay things that would uh, you know a year ago would have been yes let's do it now it's yes let's do it but it might be a month or two months before the contract gets signed so what are you seeing I think I'm in a really unique position uh, one, I've been in the sector for a long time, even as a child. And so I've seen other parts of the building. I personally think that for me in performance industry, the contracts will still say the same. Yes, there's some of the late standing. Yes, there's changes in budgets and how we access budgets. There's definitely, for what I'm seeing, there's definitely money, less money in the pipeline for the projects that we used to do. However, I know from recession and watching history, people need art and culture more when times are bad than when they're good. Um, so I foresee that we'll see changes in how money is spent, but it's going to be spent on the same thing in a different way. Yep. So, you know, like when I started in the sector, I was working with youth crime prevention, using circus skills for kids, like work remotely, works you know, great places like Nunanjara, Alice Springs, all those spaces, you know, crime prevention was a huge thing or um, uh, drug-related uh, behaviours. About 10 years ago, all that funding dried up and guess what funding started to roll out again? Because when things are getting bad, like people look for escapes, children doubly so because yep. things aren't good at home. So, in so prevention you know, there, you know, after the fact, you know, um, yeah, you know, the police yeah. and, yeah. Yeah, don't, you know, go set up an after midnight basketball program instead. If you've got vagrancy on a street, go set up Give some sport and have some food. Like that's most of the issues. Like is there enough food at home? Probably not. Is there something to do that's not going to get them hurt or in trouble with someone else? Probably not. Like it's pretty, you know, it's just going to be spent it's elsewhere. Not that hard. Yeah. And yeah, prevent. Yeah, and we know. Mm. Yeah, you can spend $5 in arts and culture and there's a great um uh, organization called Culture Counts and they also run Praxis which is a, a reporting um, diagnostic tool that government uses here a lot and if you spend five dollars on art in especially physical stuff it can save twenty five dollars in healthcare and crime prevention so it's a no-brainer 
you know so now we're just getting into that different part of our capacity of like when we're designing programs and like WA day might be telethon like what are we designing for who are we designing for who are we inspiring what is the purpose and the purpose is spreading joy making connections and it must and be more- such a wonderful place to like um I am not an artist in any stretch of any imagination. Um, I always joke that if you want people to leave it and go home at the end of the party, I'll start singing. They will all leave immediately um, and completely uncoordinated. Um, but for you and your team to be able to to perform and just see the joy, it's that instant gratification of, you know, having that instant effect on people must be a, a wonderful um, place to be. Yeah, and it's it's unique for everyone. You know, like we'd have this giant diamond. It's, it, I don't know if you're a Harry Potter fan, you know, the Quidditch, mm. like hoop oh, bowl. Yes. Like there's, yep. we've, we made some versions of that here. It's called a lollipop lira um, because a lot of places we can't rig because there's no facilities. We don't, we have a lot of resources in terms of venues here in Western Australia. We don't have pokies, so there's not actually that much money for entertainment compared to the Eastern States. But I wanted to make something fancier, so I made a six-sided princess cut diamond, which I was happy to send you a photo of. Um, and I was six months postpartum. I was like, I just want to make this thing because it was Lifeline, and I knew how much Lifeline had contributed, especially to Western Australia. And they had a diamond ball. I was like, I'll make them a diamond. Like, it cost me a fortune. And I remember because it was really the first time that some of the um, big social events were coming back in 2021 because the like gala balls just weren't happening because no one was buying tickets and i remember a beautiful group of socialites and instagrammers walking into the ballroom looking amazing just amazing i'm feeling super self-conscious because i'm you know not at my best still i can just get into my costume i'm still breastfeeding so i'm like am i going to milk through this costume Mm, who knows um and they're squealing like like little girls shrieking with delight because there's a Fancy lady on a diamond, standing three meters in the air, pouring champagne, beckoning them over. I'm like, this is what it's about. Like, I know it's completely vacuous, but they're going to remember that for the rest of their lives. I didn't, and this time, no one was like filming. It was this the moment in COVID where people were actually just happy to be out and together yeah. and sharing these moments. And that's that's the thrill point. And I still remember those moments of. Um actually going out and being with people. I, I remember the earlier times when it was, I'm like, you know, oh, you know, that time that we went to Tony Robbins in Sydney and there was three and a half thousand people in, in a stadium. Do you think we'd ever do that again? Um, like th- that we would want to? Hell yeah. <laughs> At the time, I was like, mm, not so sure. But I remember that mo- those moments of first being able to go out and do things and be with other people. And um, and you're right, it, it, it's... It, and you know we ex- we remember experiences we don't remember stuff and things but we remember experiences yeah. and for you to be able to provide those is is amazing now i am going to have to call it here I, you and i could talk for hours and i'm really looking forward to getting back and doing another one of these when you're going to share your new business with us but let's just finish off with three tips three things for you to share with our audience um things that might be uh resources or but what are those three things you'd love to share um we spoke about it briefly in the, in the in our warm up uh read just read and read things that make you feel uncomfortable my goal this year was 80 books which i'm very close to um completing and it just keeps me out of social media and actually um digesting ideas not opinions um at someone else's leisure like i'm cultivating my own um my own diet the same way I do in my day-to-day life. So choose what you're consuming to nurture yourself, especially if you're going after a goal. Join EO. Um, I feel like I, I say it to everyone. I, I can't convince artists for some reason. I don't know. They're just they're, Some will be ready. And if you're an artist and you would like my experience, please, because, you know, it's our ethical duty to be successful in the world and live the life that we want to. And the only way you're going to do that is to get out of your own way. And then third, um, four, let go earlier, especially relationships and people. The, the couple of big lessons that I had um, were really 
I don't really know how to explain this, but holding on to memories of old relationships that actually weren't true, you know, whether they're the employees or friends or just people growing apart and have the convers have that crucial conversation earlier of like, you know, we're not filling each other with not to use the, the trite filling with joy, but if you're not good, you're not good together. If you're not walking away feeling great that you've seen someone in your life, you either have to have the hard conversation where you could be, ta- you could be, you as in me, could be taking up that person's space to find the next best person in their life. And I think with social media, we haven't, we're not able to separate ourselves mm. as much as we used to. So you don't get that. And I use dating as the thing is like, the dump, the fight, like it's off, it's done. Like time out. Yeah, you've still got that connection. Five years. Yeah. You're stuck. The yeah. network is really insidious. Um, and I think that's 10 times harder with friends or if you employed people that you knew and the work for you for a really long time. It can eat at you and create a weight that you never really knew you were carrying because you have a belief on how that relationship is. And when you grow and when you change, people aren't always growing with you or know how to grow with you or want to. Or or Um, want you to grow. And then that was my big one. And if you ever want to read a really, 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 really great book about, we call it the human crab crab bucket, there's a Terry Pratchett novel about, oh gosh, I can't remember what it was. was. Anyway, it's in the Discord series. But he talks about the crab bucket and crabs will always pull themselves back into trouble and don't want to let anyone go. And families unintentionally can do that. They're just, how can they understand? Their job is to keep you safe. Same with friends. Keep you safe. Keep you close. Keep the people around you as close as you can. But it's your responsibility to live your life. There are consequences to living that life. But keep it in mind. That's great. I love that. And um, and I've been through that myself in the last few years of, of letting go. Um, a long time after I should have um, for that feeling of obligation and and that sort of thing. And um, it did not serve me at all. And now that I've done it, I am in a much, much better place. So great share. Well, I am going to stop it. Sorry. Go. Oh, no. My other thing is write your own template for no with with that obligation in mind. I have like a three-page document after reading Tribe of of Mentors of how Mm -hmm. I say no to different people and test them and like put across and I share it all the time with especially um, female entrepreneurs who really struggle and a lot of artists who want to be people pleasing no is the best word that you can learn yeah I uh, one of the workshops that I run that's actually one of the exercises we get people to practice saying no um, because um, we say yes when we mean no when we don't want to say yes but we we feel obliged to and get ourselves Mm. into situations and um, and yeah it's just it's crazy so well I'm going to stop our recording now thank you so much Renee for your time today I really love talking to you getting to know you I've known you for a few years through uh, as that EO trainer Um, didn't realize it was this long because yeah you were pregnant so it must be three and a half years Um, but thank you and as I said look forward to staying in touch and getting you back on and hearing about your new venture. Thank you, Jenny. I look forward to listening to the rest of the series. Great. Thank you.